Hello and welcome to another episode of Unworthy History. Here on this channel we talk about people whose shoes were unworthy to stand in. And one of those uh, people has very big shoes, and that's Bigfoot Wallace. So today I'm going to read another story uh, from this book, The Adventures of Bigfoot Wallace by John C. Duvall. Uh, so both Bigfoot and John C. Duvall, they were early Texas settlers, and John C. Duvall uh, wrote down this chronicle of Bigfoot's adventures and published it about 1871. So we like to read a lot of old books on this channel. So where we're picking up today is Bigfoot Wallace had been let out for execution. He had then been saved by an old squaw from the tribe. Uh, and then he had uh, joined her family, so she had taken him in as a substitute for a son that she had lost in battle. Uh, so she had another son who also lived there, and that son was named Black Wolf. Uh, and so here we're going to hear uh, Black, uh, Black Wolf's story. Uh, this was a story that, uh, a legend that had been told to him by his father when he was just a little boy. A great many years ago, said Black Wolf, a young chief belonging to one of the most powerful tribes of Arkansas concluded that he would visit one of the nearest white settlements and see some of the people whom he had heard so much. So he took his gun and dog, crossed the Father of Waters in his canoe, and traveled for many days towards the rising sun through a dense forest that had never echoed to the sound of the white man's axe. One day, just as the sun was setting, he came to the top of a high hill, and four or five miles away in the valley below, he saw the smoke curling up from the chimneys of the most western settlements, at that time east of the Mississippi River. As it was too late to reach the settlement before dark, the chief sought out the thickest part of the woods, where he spread his blanket upon the ground and laid himself down upon it with the intention of passing the night there. He had scarcely settled himself to rest when he heard a halloo, a long way off among the hills. In a few moments, an Indian warrior stalked up and took a seat near the chief and gazed mournfully at him out of his hollow eyes without uttering a word. He was dressed in a different garb from anything the chief had ever seen worn by the Indians, and he held a bow in his withered hand and a quiver filled with arrows was slung across his shoulders. As the chief looked more closely at him, he saw that this unearthly visitor was in fact a grinning skeleton, for his white ribs showed plainly through the rents in his robe, and though seemingly he looked at the chief, there were no eyes in the empty sockets he turned toward him. Presently the figure rose up and in a hollow voice spoke to the chief and told him to return from whence he came, for their race was doomed, that he was the spirit of one of his forefathers and that he came to warn him of the fate that awaited him and his people, that he could remember when the Indians were as numerous as the leaves on the trees and the white people were few and weak and shut up in their towns upon the seashore. Now they are strong and their number cannot be counted and before many years they will drive the last remnant of the red race into the waters of the great western ocean. Go back, said the figure, advancing toward the chief and waving his withered hand, and tell your people to prepare themselves for their doom and to meet me in the happy hunting grounds where the white man shall trouble them no more. The chief was as fearless a warrior as ever went to battle, but when he felt the cold touch of that skeleton hand, a horrible dread took possession of him, and he remembered nothing of what happened afterward. In the morning, when he woke up, the sun was shining brightly over his head, and the birds were whistling and chirping in the trees. He looked around for his gun and was surprised beyond reason when he picked it up and found that the barrel was all eaten up with rust, and the stock so decayed and rotten that it fell to pieces in his hand. His dog was nowhere to be seen, and he whistled and called to him in vain. But at his feet he saw a heap of white bones, among which there was a skeleton of a neck, with a collar his dog had worn still around it. He then noticed that his buckskin hunting shirt was decayed and mildewed, and hung in tatters upon him, and that his hair had grown so long that it reached down nearly to his waist. Bewildered by all these sudden and curious changes, he took his way toward the top of the hill, from which the evening before he had seen the smoke rising up from the cabins of the frontier settlement. And what was his astonishment when he saw, spread out in the valley below him, a great city with its spires and steeples rising up as far as his eye could extend. And in places of dense, unbroken forests that covered the earth when he came, a wide open country presented itself to his view, fenced up into fields and paths 
pastures and dotted over the, with the white man's stately houses and buildings. As he gazed at all this in surprise and wonder, he could distinctly hear from where he stood the distant hum of the vast multitude who were laboring and trafficking and moving about in the great city below him. Sad and dispirited, he turned his course homeward, and after traveling through many days through farms and villages and towns, he at length reached once more the banks of the mighty Mississippi. But the white people had got there before him, and in place of a silent and lonely forest, he found a large town built up where it had once stood, and saw a huge steamboat puffing and paddling along, right where he had crossed the Father of Waters in his little canoe. When he had crossed the river, he found that the white settlements had gone on a long ways beyond it, but at length he came to the wilderness again, and after wandering about for many moons, he at last came up with the remnant of his people, but now no longer a powerful tribe such as he had left them, for they had dwindled down to a mere handful. His father and mother were dead, his brothers and sisters were all dead, and no one knew the poor old warrior that had appeared so suddenly among them. For a while he stayed with them and talked in the strangest way about things that had happened long before the oldest people in the tribe were born. But one day, after telling the story I have told you, he took his way toward the setting sun and was never seen more. Uh, so that was Black Wolf's story. That was a story told to Bigfoot Wallace uh, by his uh, Indian brother, uh, who was the uh, brother of the squaw who had taken him in. Uh, so anyhow, uh, we'll bring you more uh, stories like these in the next episode. Uh, we'll continue the story of Bigfoot Wallace. So if you want to hear more stories like this, then be sure to like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time here on Unworthy History.